kind of the contrast to what we've been studying. This is um, about Satan tonight, but I'm sure it's going to, you know, I just pray that it's going to be edifying. I, you know, God will minister to us tonight as we study, as we study this and in introduction to theology. Um, I'm trying to think how we can start. Um, the women's seminar is tomorrow, right? It's all day tomorrow. And uh, we can, you know, have great expectations from that. Uh, we have visitors. Who's visiting with the women's seminar? Who's here visiting? Okay, great. We were just clapping for you coming in the door, Phil. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, we've heard messages about charity, about love, right? We've heard messages about love, agape love, God's love. Um, uh, just one thing. One thing just that I, I was, well, one thing that we know about as we study, as we study Satan, it's so good that we've studied the attributes of God before this because um, we can learn, we can know what God is like and because Satan is so deceptive, we have to know what God is like um, to recognize the devices of Satan. Um, I think is what we'll do. Um, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to start with Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Okay, and this may be new to some people. It may be you know something that you're familiar with, but it's it's. Um, I'm going to actually try not to go to Genesis chapter three, uh, because we could learn we could learn a lot in. Genesis chapter 3 about Satan. Um, I guess I'll leave that up to you. Uh, there's so much to learn about his nature there. Um, it's like an introduction to Satan, but I, I, I might go there. We might not go there tonight, but I want to focus on this Ezekiel 28 and then also uh, Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 are the five I wills of Satan. Have you ever, has anyone ever not heard that before? The five I wills of Satan? You've never heard that? Good. You've never heard it. What if you've never heard it? Okay, good. That's great. So we're, we're learning something then. And, um, and Ezekiel 28 is also a, a, a scripture that is very descriptive of Satan. So let's pray again. God, we... We thank you. We thank you that we can learn about you. We thank you that uh, we can put you before our face. God, we thank you that you reveal yourself to us and that you are personal, God. You're not so big or so impersonal that we cannot have a relationship, but you even know when a sparrow falls from the sky number the hairs in our head, God. We just realize how infinitely personal you are in our lives. In each one here tonight, God, you care, you love, you are a good God too. Thank you, God. Thank you for our new names that are written in heaven. Thank you. Thank you for eternal life, God. Thank you for the security that we have, that we are hid with Christ in God. Thank you for that. The seal of the Holy Spirit, completely sealing us until the day of redemption. Thank you, God. Thank you for the body of Christ, that we can come here tonight and be with the body. Thank you for light that light can go into our soul. God, and even tonight, 
bring divine reversals in our life. God, give us hope. Deliver us, God, we pray. In Christ's name, in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Okay. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Um, Ezekiel 28, you could say this is in the beginning uh, from verse 1 to verse 11 is uh, a, a judgment that is being um, prophesied upon an enemy of Israel, um, a neighboring country. Um, but then um, we actually see a transition from uh, God speaking to that, that king to actually he's referring to Satan in, uh, chap- in verse 12. Okay? The son of me, uh, it says there, the son of man take up a, a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Thou sealest up the sum, the full wisdom, and wait. Thus sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And this is a description of actually of Satan. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of of God, and here in verse twelve we see, um, we start to learn. Well, first of all, Satan is a person; he's a created being. Many times, people we think of him just as an evil force, and he becomes something that's very subjective, and we can label him and involve him when we want to. And when something goes bad, you know, we can put his name in the mix, and then it becomes bad. And then he's, he's gone until something bad happens again. But he's actually a person. He actually exists. Okay? And he's a created being. And maybe one of the greatest distinctions, that the way to remember, God is uncreated. God is uncreated. He has no beginning and no end. Satan is a created being. And we'll see in Isaiah 14 where Satan has a desire to be like God. But here we're learning about Satan. And it says, uh, seals up the sum. Some of, when it says that in verse 12, some people say that that is actually like, he had this finishing touch. Like if, if a painting was going to be painted, he would put the finishing touch on it. And, you know, we talk about the finished work here. And you can see that, you know, like um, Lucifer here, as we're referring him as uh, he was he was created and he had a very large role, a very important role. He was a, a, a very maybe the highest created angel. So and he had a very important role before God. And he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He knows a lot about wisdom, he loves knowledge, and he also knows what is beautiful. And we'll, you know, hopefully we'll touch on these, like as he's the, the prince of the power of the air and the god of this, this age, we will see some of his strategies and actually what his ultimate goal is. Maybe I'll just say that right now, just so we, we, we think along these lines. Like, Satan's goal is not to make you sin. Okay? This is not Satan's goal. It's not to, like, trip you up and to cause problems in your life. This is not his ultimate goal. His ultimate goal is to be like God, is to be higher than God, is to substitute God, to have another kingdom where he's the ruler of. And in, in, in that quest, we can become included. Okay? We can take on the spirit of Satan. We can become independent from God. But his, his real desire is actually he's in a contest with God. And this is why, there's seats up here if you need some. This is why... Um, we do not battle against flesh and blood. The contest is actually, it's, it's, it's Satan and God. And we are over here, we are over here, and uh, God is going to use us in that contest to bring glory to him, to show us his resurrection, to show us his mercy, to show us his forgiveness. And Satan has a desire, which God allows in his sovereignty, which we know in, in Job and, uh, and, and Joshua and Zeph- Zechariah, Zechariah, yeah, in Zechariah chapter 3, where Satan 
has access to God and actually has to get permission from God to do what he wants to do in our lives. So um, if we're familiar, remember the, the, the messages that Pastor Schaller has, has spoken about how, well, he mentioned it recently, how close evil, God allows evil to get to him. And this doesn't bother God. He is sovereign. God is in control. And just like Judas was next to Jesus Christ, this did not bother a sovereign God. And just as Satan is so, was so close, uh, was so vital in, 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 in the, you could say, in the plan of God, but it, it doesn't bother God when, when evil is stirred up this close to God. And this is very good. This is something good for us to think about because we have a provision from God. It doesn't matter like how bad something happens to us or how, how um, devastating something actually is. There's, there's a sovereign God. There's a, there's a plan of God that is always, you know, like God is able to, um, um, what, you know, what the devil means for evil, God's tr- able to turn around and use it for his good. This is, this is a premise in our thinking, because remember, we learned that God is good. Okay, so um, this, maybe, maybe we'll look, just keep your finger there, I'm going to put my, my notes there. Uh, turn to uh, Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 1. Okay. Second from the last book. Next to the last book. Okay. Now, this is the thought of man. Verse 12, and it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles. Did I say chapter 1? Yeah. Chapter 1, verse 12. This is a, it's, yeah, this is it. And I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their leaves. Okay, what does that mean? I will punish the men that are settled on their lease. Really, is what, hap- what has happened is when we start, when we have natural thoughts about God, lees is like, like, it's like the sediment, you know, an apple cider falling to the bottom of the bottle. Okay, it's like naturally what happens uh, through gravity, it goes to the bottom. And um, no faith is stirred up. The nature of God is not used in our life. And maybe we knew about God, but we're not using the nature of God in a difficult time, just in the details of our life. And we start to have conclusions or we start to have reasoning that is actually from below. And um, it, it, it has these conclusions that we actually learned against the nature of God, something that we learned the last few weeks. And look here. It says, um, they were settled on their leaves. We understand what that means. They go back to the natural. Like, you know, you shake orange juice up with the pulp in it, right? It's all mixed everywhere. But if you don't, if you don't shake it up, it's all down there at the bottom. And this is what happens when we don't live by faith. The nature of God is not active in our life. And this is what we start to say. Um, It says here, they will say in their heart, and this is what we will really think, that the Lord will not do good. Remember we spoke last week about the goodness of God? And we start to believe that the Lord is not good. He's not good towards my situation, towards my life. Like I've missed out on something. Like there's something, there's some little element that I'm missing, therefore God will not be good to me. This is settling on our leaves, and we're, we're, we're not living in faith. And then, and then the, the second part, the second part of that, and it's like there's no consequences. Like there will be no consequences. The Lord will not do evil. Like 
It, even though I'm thinking like this, there's no consequences because I'm thinking like this. And this is, this is really, uh, I, I don't know why I, I brought this up, but this, was, this, is, this is how Satan, he does not want us to think with God. It's because, it's not that he doesn't want us to think with God, because I, I said that. He has another kingdom that he's, you know, he wants to establish that's, that's greater than God's or replaces God's, and he wants us to be involved. But um, that system, when we're included in it, when we participate in it, these are our thoughts towards God. Okay, so um, back to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28. Satan is, is beautiful and he has wisdom. Uh, he's perfect in beauty, okay? And uh, thou hast seen the garden of the garden of God, every precious stone, okay? And it goes a list of all of these stones. And there's something about stones, which makes them beautiful, is that they're not beautiful on their own, okay? They're only beautiful in light, right, Jamie? They're only beautiful in light. They need light. And Satan was created, just like we were created, to reflect the glory of God. And this is, this is what Satan, like, he wasn't satisfied with that. It's like he almost, like, believed that God is not sovereign. And, like, I can go to a place where God is not in control, and I can become greater than God. And he didn't like this. Like, even though he, he had authority, but he was still under authority, he didn't like this place of where he was reflecting, had to reflect the glory of God. He almost wanted to be the source. And this is a danger in our lives when we want to be the source and we don't want God to be reflected in our life or, or we, we get familiar with why we're here to actually reflect the glory of God. Life becomes easy when we realize that we're here to reflect the glory of God. We're, eight, we're to give to somebody love or forgiveness is something I don't have, and then I can give it to them. But when we think like we have to produce the light, love and forgiveness, it's like life gets very confusing. It gets very difficult. It's like we get like all tied up and we don't know what to do in life and we feel like we're powerless and then we start to blame other people. But when we receive glory, when we receive glory and reflect it, we find out, oh, that's what I was created for. And, uh, and so this is, we're, we're learning about Satan here, and actually we can learn something about our own lives there. And it says, uh, thou art anointed, uh, verse 14, that a cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, thou wast also upon the holy mountain of God, and thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Satan, or Lucifer, was close to God. He was a minister to God. He, he, he just like in um, Isaiah, where we see the angel, Isaiah 6, where we see the angels with their wings, you know, worshiping a holy God. Like, Satan, Satan was like this. Okay, he had this type of position. Thou was uh, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. He's a created being. He is a being. He's not just some mystical, evil force. Until iniquity, and there it is, there it is, iniquity was found in him. Something happened in his heart, in his desires. And uh, why don't we go to, I, now we'll go to, so iniquity. Iniquity was found in Satan. And we, we, we learned about this, we learned about this word iniquity, but this is like, I have a plan that's greater than God's, or I have a plan that is absent of God. And this is even, we see the cosmos, the, the, you know, the Greek word, the word cosmos, the world system. It is an, an elaborately ordered um, system. The cosmos is an, an ordered system where God is not needed. This is what Satan is designing. He's trying to design a system, and he wants us to be a participant in that system where God is not needed. Okay, so let's, let's look at um, Isaiah 14. Okay. 
Okay, Isaiah 14. It's Isaiah 14. The, here's Lucifer is introduced in verse 12. Okay. Lucifer, speaking of a, of a morning star, okay, a bright light, the sun of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? Okay. It says in verse 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend to heaven. He said, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne. Like, he was, you know, there's, there's three heavens. There's just the heavens where the birds are. There's the heavens where the stars are. And there's the heaven where God makes his habitation, which is the third heaven. And then the second is where the stars are. And the third, you can say, is the bird in the atmosphere is where we live. And Satan wanted to go up to the, the third heaven. Okay? He wanted to actually have his residence there, like where God had it. And then he says, I will exalt my throne above the stars, the stars of God, and I will sit upon the mountain, the side of the congregation. Um, like, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Like, he wanted to be in control and have the ultimate authority over God's created beings. He did not want to be in subjection. He did not want authority. He wanted to, to purge this responsibility, but we see the the, the authority is actually a privilege and a covering in our life. And he wanted to eliminate this in his life. Okay? And I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, okay, in the sides of the north, and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Like, God led Israel by a, a cloud by day, and this represented his glory, and a cloud came down upon Solomon's temple, you know, referring to the glory of God. Satan wanted the glory. He did not want to give God glory. He wanted to receive the glory back from other people. This is this amazing study. We find out what actually can get into our hearts. Okay? And we, we, in 1 Timothy 3, 6, when there's the qualifications of, 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 a, of an elder, we actually see that you know, the sin of Satan is pride. And this can come into our hearts. 1 Timothy 3, 6, okay, in the qualifications of elders. And this can actually come into our hearts. And he said, I want to be like the Most High. It's like, I don't want to be a created being. I want to be the, the, you know, the, the first and the last. You know, I want to be the one that was infinite, that always was. I'm not satisfied with being below somebody. So these are, the, these are the five I wills of Satan. Okay, and you can study these on your own. But now you've seen, is that, who, who saw that for the first time again? Who saw that for the first time? Good. Huh? Okay, okay, good. You, did, you didn't? Oh, you, oh, I thought you said you didn't realize before that there were bullet points. I don't know what you explained, but I did not see them as Adam 1 versus the 12 rovers and the 7 versus 12. You know what I mean? But now, you, can you see that no, there? Oh, didn't we just. Oh, oh, the I wills. Okay, I will ascend into heaven is the first one. Okay, verse 13. Do you see it? Okay, in verse. 13, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Okay, do you see the five I wills there? Okay. Okay. Yet thou shalt be brought down in verse, okay? Okay, good. This is good. This is an introduction to theology. And it's, 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 if anybody's going to become a, a, a pastor, 
you, you, like, you, you're going to use these things, and you're going to study these verses a lot along with, Rome, and with Genesis chapter 3. You could, you could, you know, uh, about evil, you can, uh, Genesis chapter 3, Isaiah 14, and Ezekiel 28, you can learn a lot about Satan. You learn a lot about evil. And you can actually, you know, this is, it's like the, the foundation of actually understanding the strategies of, of, of Satan. Okay? Okay. So, um, we, so we know where those verses are. Okay? Any questions? Any questions? Okay. I want to start with some of my notes. So, um, uh, so my notes, I... You know, like I, I just pull them from a bunch of different books and, you know, some ideas and some verses. And uh, so it's, it's, it's going to be a little bit of a mixture. Um, we're going to go through some of the names of Satan, some of the characteristics of Satan, um, the judgments of Satan. And finally, at the end, I want to go into the things that Satan does not like. Okay, the things that Satan does not like. Okay. Um, some of these things maybe I've already touched on, but th remember, Satan is our enemy. He has, he has a plan for himself, and we just read what, like, like his desires in that plan, and he wants us to be included in that. Okay? He desires that we also would join him in the ranks, also in, a, in, a, uh, in another kingdom that, that, peril, that is like greater than God's. Okay, so Satan, he was originally created without sin. Okay, he was not created with sin. God did not create Satan with sin. And we just, we read today about where iniquity was found in Satan. Okay? Um, we read about Satan's origin in Ezekiel 28. He was a cherub, C-H-E-R-U-B. He was a cherub angel, a high-ranking angel. In verse 15, he was created blameless. Like, this is how God created him. And then he lost his holiness. Okay? However, he is still beautiful. He is still beautiful. I was thinking that we, we receive a position from God that we can never lose, and later we're going to see Satan is the opposite of us. He's going to gradually lose his position till he's cast into the lake of fire. Ours is secured when we believe, but Satan, he's cast out of heaven, then we see he's cast to the earth, he's put into the abyss, and then at the end in Revelations 20, he's put into the lake of fire. So Satan is losing his position. He's losing his position, and he hates it. And Satan hates the idea of that there's going to be the end of time because he knows what the end of time means to him. And he knows he's running out of time. Okay, He hates, that's one thing Satan hates, is he hates the end of time. Because he has his little uh, party during time. But when there's the end of time, he knows, he knows what's going to happen to him, even though he lives in denial. And he will try to the end to establish his kingdom that is higher than God's, that is greater than God's. Um, a great verse, if you turn to Jude, verse 9, you see the angels... There's a, there's a ranking of angels, and the angels had different authorities. And you see Michael, the archangel, where he was actually, um, well, we, we'll read the verse here, but we see he, he realized, even though Satan had fallen uh, from Lucifer, he, he actually respected the power that Satan had. So Satan still had power, but, and he still had his beauty, but he's, he's losing his position gradually over time. And he hates that. Satan hates that fact when we've been given a position that we cannot lose through redemption. He hates the fact of our position 
and he will attack our position all the time because he knows so much about losing his position. Okay? Verse 9, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. Michael, the archangel, had this respect in, in, in angelic conflict of the power of Satan. And he, it's like, it's like, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We must use um, not our own ability, and we, might not, we shouldn't even take this conflict personally. We shouldn't even take it personally, but it's like, the Lord rebuke you. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We are not required to actually have a victory personally against Satan. It is the ability of God inside of us that gives us our victories in life against Satan's kingdom. Okay, so that's, that's Jude uh, verse 9. Jude verse 9. Okay, the, uh, the, his first sin, um, I've already spoken about that, the nature of his first sin, okay, and we learned about the consequences of his first sin. He was cast down from the mountain he was cast down from this high place, from ministering to God, from, uh, from the holiness of God. And that's Ezekiel 28, 16, and 17. It's all right there in Ezekiel. Okay? And now he does not have service before God, but he still has access to God for communication. Like what we see in Job chapter 1 verse 6, and then also in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. He has access to God for communication purposes. Okay, but he, because he, he can go to this, he's in the second heaven where the second and third heaven meet, he, has, he can communicate to God, but he doesn't have access to go into the third heaven. Okay. Um, and Satan must always operate inside the boundary of God's authority. He can never operate outside of God's sovereignty. This is Job uh, chapter 1 verse 12 and uh, John chapter 17 verse 15. Okay. Uh, Job 1 12 and John 17 15. Okay. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. Let's turn there. Okay, these are our strategies of warfare of Satan. These are the strategies of, of the warfare of Satan against the children of God. Okay, I just want to say this. Like, Satan has authority, or he is like a ruler of the unregenerated or the unsaved. He, has, he wants to attack us, but there's nowhere in the scriptures where it speaks about him attacking the unsaved. They are part of his kingdom, okay? We were a part of that kingdom in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, but we're no longer a part of that kingdom. But we turn to Ephesians, Ephesians 6. Okay, Satan is very ordered. In, in Job, it speaks about where he's like, there's no air between his scales. Like, he's so ordered. Like, he hasn't left any, any strategy, any, um, any uh, there's like, there's no loopholes or there's no, uh, what do we say? Nothing falls through the cracks in Satan's strategy. He's very organized in his, in his assault against God. And his assault against God includes attacking us because we are vessels of God's love, okay? He hates, he hates people receiving, receiving the love of God. He hates us being vessels that receive the glory of God. And so Satan, like I said, Satan has an ordered system here, and we see it, uh, let's see, we rest verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay, and there we see 
we see the order of Satan from ruling demons all the way to these operational demons that demons may study your countenance, okay? They may study how initiations provoke you, and they, 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 they study your history, okay? They, they know the, the, your family history. They know, they know your genetics. They, do not, they cannot read our thoughts. They do not know what our thoughts are. They can project what our thoughts might be. They study our lives, okay? And this is Satan's, and so it says here, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. If, if, we, pulled, if we pulled the curtain away of, like, of what reality really is, we would be shocked at the, you know, the, really what's happening is there's a huge warfare happening up here, and we don't even see that warfare. And this is, this is what's going on all the time. And we're not wrestling with flesh and blood against that battle there. Maybe we can turn to Colossians. It's Colossians chapter 2. Okay. Verse 14. Blotting out. This is an incredible verse. Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing to the cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers. There it is. He has spoiled this strategy of, of, the, of Satan and his armies that come against us by nailing what, whatever accusation Satan could bring against us, he has nailed it to the cross so that Satan does not have the right to actually accuse us. And we see this as Joshua, this, this amazing thing. This is our authority. This is our authority. It's like the, the principalities and powers are rendered uh, like, uh, like without any weapons, without any strength when we go to the, when we go to the cross. Okay, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumph, triumphing over them. Okay, so this is where Satan actually met his defeat, even though he will not accept it, or he still thinks he has a chance, but this is where he met his defeat, and this is where we actually have our victory. Okay? Um, Okay, I think I mentioned this already, that uh, Satan has an ambition and authority in this world, and it's against God, and it's not to make us sin. And we can read about how we sin in James chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. Okay, it's when we, it's when we uh, actually uh, feed our soul, when we feed our soul something from the flesh, and we feed upon that, and it leads to sin. Okay, this is in James chapter 1. Some people are looking at me like confused, like they've never heard that before. I'll read that. Okay. Let no man, in verse 13, let no man say, do you see James chapter 1? Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But here's how man is tempted in verse, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. This is why the crucifixion, the new man, is so important. When we live in the, in the new man, the new man does not have those desires. The old man has those desires. And Satan hates the new creation because there's nothing for him to feed into, okay? And like we learned last, like we learned, like we learned in, on Wednesday night about love, agape love, it is, it is the greatest weapon of warfare that you can ever have in a trial. And you can find love, you can put out the fires, the, the fires that come towards you. You can, you can take love, you can take love and it extinguishes 
every fire. You know, sometimes we say, well, you can speak too much about, but I, I was thinking of this, this love, this agape love that has, it's like you can put a, a blanket, you can put a blanket of forgiveness over people because God has nailed the handwritings of the ordinances to the cross. And like God looks at something else in our life and he doesn't look at what we were. He looks at the new creation. And, and when we have agape love towards what, what God has done, we destroy. But if we look at the old man, we're always surfacing up something and we can never have we never have agape love towards when we look at somebody, we know somebody after the flesh. We want to change them so that we can love them in the flesh. That is the, that's the temptation of man. And that's, when, that's how man has problems in relationships. He wants to change something in somebody's flesh so that he can love them. And when he meditates and desires that, okay, and it becomes his goal, he can never experience agape love, and then he can never have forgiveness. He can never have a, a, a reconciliation with that person. And if that person does change, it's only temporal. And he's, he's never satisfied because it was only temporal. But when we have agape love, look how many fires that puts out. We're not desiring, do you understand this? We're not desiring something that will not satisfy, that will not, we're becoming... When we live outside of agape, we become the tail in life. We're no longer the initiator. We're waiting for someone else to change. And that is how Satan would love us to live this life. Okay, he wants us to, uh, as he promised Adam and Eve, be your own gods. You guys will be as gods. That's his desire. That we will... will change things and be able to love what we changed like the way that God has done it. But God did it in a righteous way. We can never do, pr produce change in a righteous way. The only way that we can produce change is by receiving something from God and giving it. But when man tries to, you can be as God. You can take a mess and you can change it. Only God can take a mess and change it. And this is what he promised to Adam and Eve. You can be as gods. Okay, and that, that was a lie. And like we read in Zephaniah 1.12, um, it says like, no evil will happen if you do this. That's also, it's like, God, you know, like God's not going to punish you. It's like, there's no consequences. Really? There's no consequences when we, when we live outside of agape? There's huge consequences when we live outside of agape. Okay, so what were we doing? We're reading James. Oh, yeah, verse 14. And every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. We're talking about the new man, right? The new man versus the old man. Like our new creation, our new creation, well, it's, it's like this, it's like this, it just it has it has this this built-in armor of God. And this is what sometimes what I think of in 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 uh, Ephesians six, like the the weapons of our warfare. Uh, this is just an idea, like what I what I thought of sometimes. Like it's it's not so much to be offensive and f you know fight in the flesh and like do do battle and you know it's like you know like I you know like 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 that. It's, it's, it's to get to the presence of God. We put on the whole armor of God so we can go to the presence of God. That's where we fellowship with God, in the holy place. It's not to be isolated from God. It's to actually be with God. And we put on the whole armor so that we can stay with God. It's not to go out and do battle independent from God. You know, the, the helmet of salvation. You know, and we... The breastplate of righteousness, you know, the, our, our loins are girded with truth. You know, it's, it's like so that we can run into the presence of God with our life. Isn't that what we really want to do in life? We want to go to the presence of God. We want to be with God. And when we're with God, it's amazing. Like, like we see here, we're, we're re reflecting glory. We're under authority. It's like then we are amazing warriors. We're amazing warriors. Sometimes we have that concept wrong in my, you know, I, I did, I do. 
like, yeah, I'm, I'm like battles, I hate all the weapons of warfare, you know, I'll cut down anything. But it's actually so, so we can go to the presence of God. Okay? Because there's strategies against us. The strategies of Satan is so that we would not go to the presence of God. That we would live as gods and not come under authority. Okay. Um, Satan. Satan is the father of lies in Matthew 8, verse 44. That's how he deceives. And his lies, his lies have so much truth we cannot recognize them. And that's why we say God is light and in him is no darkness. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to bring that extra check on it. It's like, you know, is this truth? Like, you know, like... Scott, can you hold this up? Just hold this up. I just try to give us an example. <clears throat> You know, just say this is this is truth, and only uh, wait. What is your name? Huh? Ricky. And Ricky is looking at this, and what is really truth? It's just say this is the word. Okay, can you hold it up straight like that. Okay, this is. Can you see white behind there, Ricky? In between my hand? Okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> now can you see white? No. Now can you see white? Okay. Mm, now can you see white? A little bit. You can see it, right? Now can you see light? White? No. It's the Word and the Spirit working together. And this is how we know what truth is. The Word and the Spirit always work together like this, and this is our confirmation in life. This is why, uh, so we don't get legalistic, so, we know, so we're sensitive to God, and we're not puffed up in our knowledge you know, about the Word. We're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and we're not all you know, emotional in the Holy Spirit here. It has to line up with the Word. If it doesn't line up with the Word, it doesn't work either. It always must be both, so that you can see it. Okay? And Satan would love to remove one or the other, okay? Or just tilt them a little bit so that we don't see the truth, okay? And that's how he actually lies to us, okay? So, what? I did. You're dismissed. No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Because my understanding, I thought, was like the helmet is to protect the wrong things from entering into your head. Yes. And you know where I'm going? Yeah. To okay. Yeah, I do. I do. I, I guess I went over. I went over that quickly. That was a thought that I had, and I prefaced it like that. Okay. Um. Um. But just okay. So. But did this did this make sense? What we just showed you? Just was go with that. Did that make sense? Okay, and Satan hates the, the Word and the Spirit going together. He hates a Spirit-filled Christian that's listening to the Word of God because they will find out what is light and what is darkness. Okay, and this is why we can't live in our knowledge of what I have received. We have to continually be receiving so that we can actually see what truth is. Because you know how much deception comes into my life? Like, like when I'm not hearing the Word of God, when I'm not... With the body of Christ, the body of Christ puts a check on my life. It's like, it's like light. It's like, do I fit in? And if I don't fit in, I say, like, God, help me. What's wrong in my life? I need the word and the spirit. Okay. Um, the weapons of our warfare. Okay. I'm, not, I, I'm just saying it's, it's all the same. It's all the same as, as just what you're saying. Like, you know, we need our loins gird about with truth. And that's what I was showing you here. You know what I mean? Our loins need to be gird about with truth. You know, and that we need the breastplate of righteousness. Okay? You know, it's like, you know, this is, this is protecting us right here. All the vitals. It's got to be the righteousness of God. There's no conflicts with the nature of God in my life. You know, and the helmet of salvation. You know, protecting what, what God has given me through what God, how God has redeemed me. 
protecting my mind that I would think with God, okay? You know, and then he's given us a, 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 he's given us a shield for the fiery darts, okay? Our offense, our, our really, our, but what I'm saying is our, our greatest offense is going to the presence of God. It's not to be independent from God, to do some great work for God. That's not really our, our desire. If you think about it in our life, like what do you want to do? I want to get to the presence of God. I want to get into the holy of holies and be with God. And that's why we put on the, the, our, our armor is so that I can live there. And then we become a warrior. You know, we are a warrior, okay? We are a soldier. We know how, you know, we're, we're using the sword. Okay, we are salty on the earth. Um, yeah, but you know, you go out and fight. Where does it lead you? It's like, oh, I'm all by myself. I just beat up somebody. But you now I want to go to the, pre you know, like what do we want to do in life? I, you know, I want to be in the presence of God in my life. I want to think with God in my life. Okay, and that is, that is offensive. And that's just, that's all I was saying. Does that make sense to you? Now that you explained it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not changing any of the definitions. I'm just saying like, a thought that you might have about the desire of a Christian to have an offensive life and how to um, put on the full armor of God. You know, it's not, to do, it's not to do a work initially. It's to go to the presence of God. And to, like, you know, I, I'm saying that lightly tonight, but really, in our, in our, you know, like, that's what, what do we really want? That's, that's what we want, is to be in the presence of God. Okay, so I was speaking about deception, okay, and, and second, uh, second uh, Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, this is, um, he wants to remove us from the simplicity that's in Christ, the singleness that's in Christ, that's Satan's desire, he wants to move us from, he wants to put us in a, hypocritical life where we have two hearts where we really don't know it's like kind of like we have two hearts it's like I really want to be at two places at the same time and when I'm here tonight I really want to be some other place I mean that's just an example like that's when we have two hearts it's like I want to be somewhere else okay Chapter 11, verse 3. Yep. Satan. I'm just telling you some activities of Satan right now. You can label it as activities. The first one was deception. The second one is destroy. He wants to destroy vessels that receive God's love. We see this in Job. He destroyed Job's children. We are temples of God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're temples of God. He hates, he hates vessels that are fit for the master's use, that receive grace from God. Okay, Satan is extremely religious. In Romans chapter 10, verse 2, right? They sought a, they had a zeal for God, but not according to the righteousness of God. Like, Satan loves zeal, but not according, to, not according to God's way, not according to God's righteousness. And this is also in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, where Satan is an angel of light. He wants to be light. He wants to be something that people run to. He does not want to be ugly. He wants to portray that he is security, that he has value. What is the name of Satan that be, yeah, Beelzebub, right? Where he has no value. Satan has no value. This is God's estimation of Satan, that Satan has no value. So Satan is religious. Satan wants to rule. We read that in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. He wants to rule. And this, is, this represents us. He wants us to have our own independent plans from God. Okay, in Zechariah, Zechariah 3.1, Satan wants to accuse. 
In Revelations 12.10, he's the accuser of the brethren day and night. He's the accuser of the brethren day and night. Who knows the, the story of uh, Joshua, the high priest in Zechariah? Do you know that story? Do you know that story, Jerry? How does it go? Huh? The Lord. <laughs> Joshua was a high priest. And, and Satan found him with dirty garments. So he had an accusation against. You can read this in, in Zechariah chapter 3. And he had dirty, he found him with dirty garments and took him to and, and took him to God. And he said, the Lord, and, and God said, The Lord rebuke you. And he had to. He had to, and Satan had to depart. And then God gave him back, you know, his clean robe, his mitre. And then, and then he gave him back his teaching position. He gave him back his ministry. Like this is the redemption of God. And Satan would love to take away all of those. He would love to take away our standing before God. Okay? He would love to take away our, our thinking with God. And we'd love to take away our ministry. And, and, like, and God said, like, he, just, he, just, he just rebuked him. But Joshua, the high priest, got these back from God. Okay? So uh, he wants to accuse. Oh, this is good. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 24, when David counted the men, um, Satan loves to inflate our ego. He loves to inflate our ego. He likes us to think that my victory came from my wisdom and the next victory I have, I'm going to calculate how to have a victory with God. And that's, what, that's ego, okay? When we think I'm calculating, outside of responding to God, when we think we're calculating our next way to have victory, our next way to satisfy our soul, when we think... And this is, that's what David did. You know, and David lost 70, th God hated that. It was like more than like, you know, what, one baby was lost, you know, like in, the, in this, you know, with Bathsheba in adultery. But this was like, God hated this. 70,000 people were killed because David was so arrogant that, that he could plan his success and he could plan his next victory. And that he did not need God to, you know, he could number, he could number his troops and he could have a strategy of how he could, have, you know, we do not battle flesh and blood. It's an amazing defeat when we try to defeat Satan with the way that we won the last battle. And we calculate how to win the next one outside of responding to God. It's like we don't, Satan is, is, it has so many strategies. Okay. Um. Should we take, no, I'll just, I'm going to go through a few of these and maybe we'll stop. I've got maybe about 20 names here for Satan, okay? Or, yeah, let's just go through some of these, okay? Are you all with me so far? I know, is, is, is Kay, okay? Are you getting it? Okay? You sure? Okay. Okay. It's good to study this after, after uh, the nature of God. Okay. After we've studied the name, Lucifer, we spoke about Lucifer already. I've already given you verses. The shining one. This was his original state of glory before his fall. Lucifer, that's Isaiah 14, where we just read about Lucifer. Um, Satan, number two, Satan means to resist. And we just read that in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Satan means to resist. Satan was standing at the right hand of Joshua the high priest. Like he wanted to resist his righteousness because righteousness, the right hand represents righteousness. He wanted to resist the nature that God had given him. Satan loves to resist our new nature, our new name, 
Okay? He, he's always resisting that. And he wants us to see our experience and let our experience um, define the character that's in our life. And that's what, you know, like Satan uh, found, say, Joshua in a sin, and he wanted to have Joshua be labeled and defined by that sin. And he wanted, that's how he resists us. He resists us. He resists our new nature. Okay? The devil, number three. This is a New Testament word. He's an accuser. He's a slanderer. That's Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. He's an accuser. And the word diabolus, okay? Dia means diameter, the diameter of a circle, right? Diabolus is the Greek word for, it's the Greek word for the devil, and it's accuser. And dia represents, dia represents the diameter. And, what, and, and balas is to throw. And what Satan does, he throws, he throws accusations in the center of our lives, in the center of friendships, in the center of marriages, in the center of the body of Christ. And he wants to divide. That's what his accusations are for. Diabolus, he wants to divide. He, dia, it's like he, he shoots a diameter through a circle, through the center of the circle, and he wants to divide it. Okay? That's the desire of Satan. Diabolus, D-I-A-B-O-L-U-S. Okay? It's Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. He's the old serpent. The old serpent. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And Revelation 20, verse 2. Serpent is very, he's very subtle. Satan, Satan can wait. Satan disguises himself. He does not want to be seen. He's, not, he's also called the, the, you know, the great dragon. The great dragon is like this. He has audacity to attack us anywhere, to look like a beast, to be around and to intimidate and to create fear. But the snake, you don't see him around. He's always suggesting. He's very subtly suggesting all the time. He's like knocking on the door really, really quietly all the time. That's, what sa that's how Satan, um, that's, that's one of his descriptions. Like, let's expose, let's like, like, it's so good to know truth and then to learn about Satan so that we can live in truth and we don't have to live in lies like, like what we said up there. So he's the old servant. He's a destroyer. Revelations 9.11 destroys. He de you know what he loves to destroy is institutions of God. See, it doesn't work. See, your way doesn't work on earth. He loves to destroy institutions from God. He hates family. He hates marriage. He hates the local church. He hates institutions from God. The great dragon is Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 and 7. Dragon represents like power, you know, like, uh, you know, like, how, how did Al Qaeda attack? the United States on September 11th. Like they had audacity, like a great dragon, right? It's like, you know, Pentagon, you know, like, you know, White House, you know, the, the, you know, the Twin Towers, you know, like, let's go after like the big stuff like that. You know, like, let's have audacity. It's like the great dragon. Like, let's just go rip and destroy and just be totally open. But there's also, there also can be covert, like under the cover. That's like the snake. That's the opposite. You don't see it's happening but it's just as bad, okay? And so these are, these are different ways that Satan works. The evil one, the evil one in John chapter 17, verse 15. In 1 John 5, 18 and 19. Kakos and Poneros. Do we know the difference between Kakos and Poneros? Two words for evil. What? Poneros is infectious evil, and that's the word that is used there for Satan in, in, as the evil one. Poneros. He's, kakos is, my nature is evil. Okay? That's kakos. But 
Paneras is this desire. It's like, it's like to spread a disease, that disease to other people. And that's who Satan is. He wants to, he's the wicked one. He wants to spread his disease of independence and his iniquity, rebelling against the plan to other people. He has Paneras. He's the wicked one. Paneras, he, he is not, you know, Kakos is just, it, it's evil, it's inside, but it may not be a desire to spread it. It just basically refers to character. But Satan is Paneros, P-O-N-E-R-O-S. Paneros, that's the Greek word for evil. P-O-N-E-R-O-S. Okay, he's that type of, he, he, he can't wait to infect someone else, to include them in, into his infected circle. Okay, and this is also in a conspiracy. It's not just that in, in a conspiracy, someone with Paneros has to share it to bring them over to their side. Okay, and they want to spread it. They want to infect other people. Okay, this is, this is a, a, that was a name of Satan. We've got like five more minutes before our break. I can finish this. Okay. Oh yeah, that's it. Belial. Belial in 2 Corinthians 6.15. Okay, and that means worthless without value. Imagine that, we, that, that Satan tries so hard to show us that he has value, that his, his system is valuable, that it's worth trying, that it's worth, buy, it's worth selling the truth and buying a lie. But Christ, Christ says there in, in, in 2 Corinthians, he's like, he's worthless. There's no value in him. And how he establishes his value, and he shows it, it's his ordered system. He's like, he says, like, you exchange this, you'll get this. And Satan always has a sale. He always has a sale. He makes it so attractive. And then if you don't like it, he makes it even more attractive. He's always, you know, like, you sell the truth. It's always, all, he always has a sale so that we will sell something in our life. He always is going to make it more attractive. Remember, the demons are stunning our lives. And they're going to make it more attractive and more attractive. This is why we need truth. Okay? And, you know, so it goes on sale. To, it's so cheap now. It's like, I'm not going to lose anything. No evil's going to happen in my life. I'm not really losing anything. That's what we think at the end when we buy Satan's lie. He makes it, when, before we sin, how many times do we say, oh, nothing will not, not happen. No, I mean, nothing will happen. There's no consequences here. If I think like that, there's no consequences there. And then we find out later, oh man, he is a liar. And then he accuses me when he gets, on, gets me on the other side after my failure. Then he's the accuser. He said, look at these dirty garments, and he's on my right side. See, you don't have the righteousness of God. And he's on that side. Then he's on that side. So this, that is Satan. That he's the prince of this world. The prince of this world. John 12, 21. I've spoke about that. He has an ordered system. The world system, the cosmos, is an ordered system where God is not needed. Okay, that's a cosmic, that's cosmos. Okay? Okay. There's a few more, but I, let's take a break there. Okay? And we're going to come back at... Uh, Quarter till, uh, quarter till. Okay, wait, Ula, do you have any announcements? No announcements. Okay, You're, we'll come back at quarter till.